few set of dynamics problems just before the exam next Tuesday. So, the first question is, a car is driving around a circular track, moving clockwise as viewed from above. So I'll draw that. Here's the track the car is running on. Um, I say at one point the car is on the plus x side of the track. So let's define our x and y. And I do say, um, oh I don't say this, but I meant, to, totally meant to say that x and y are in the plane of the ground. So you're looking down on the track, z is up in this case. Um, it's on the plus x side and it's going around clockwise. That means the car is right here right now. And the first question is, what is the direction of the velocity of the car? That way, right? That's the, what, what would be going around clockwise. So if he's over on the plus x side here, then the answer to A is the minus y direction. That wasn't too bad. Now is the interesting one. What is the direction of the acceleration of the car? So this one you want to think about. You're always tempted to say, oh, it's straight ahead. But it's not. Because he's moving around the track at constant speed. And if his speed is constant, there can't be any component of acceleration along the same direction as the speed. Why? Well, remember that acceleration is delta V over delta T. Right? So if I have V like this, and if there's a delta V that's like that in some small delta T, notice that there is a component along here. If there's any component along here, V will get longer. That the only way, really, to keep, um, where's my eraser? There it is. The only way to keep the component from getting longer is if delta V is exactly at a right angle, right? If that's at a right angle, um, I lied to you, it's not exactly at a right angle. Well, okay, it is exactly at a right angle, but it has to also be very small, right? Delta V needs to be sort of in that direction. Now you'll say, oh wait, but that is longer because it's a hypotenuse. But then what you do is really you make the, the isosceles triangle here, and then you, you let the, this acceleration only works for a very short period of time. And of course, um, the acceleration won't turn out to be constant. So it needs to be at a right angle. So, all right, so which way is it actually? Well, let's just start by just thinking in broad terms around it. That's where the car is right now. Where is the car going to be a little later? A little later, the car is going to be here, going in that direction. How has V changed? Well, what I want to do is compare this V, and now what I'm going to do, this is a thing you can do with vectors. I'm going to pick up the V and put it down. He's now going in that direction. So you can see, and then how do you do delta V? Well, this was V initial. This is V final, and as arrows, um, to go delta V final minus initial, that's the same as saying going from the initial to the final. So final minus initial. It's like if I go from four to six uh, along a number line, the distance I've gone is two, which is six minus four. So if I go from the initial here to the final, that is the direction of delta V in that case. All right, well, that's good. So, and if you then think about, of course, I'm asking what is it, his acceleration right here? If I think about this, and even later, let's think, just throw my pens everywhere. Let's think about even later, he's going to be now here, right, like that. And if I compare those two, the red one and the purple one, so the red one, oops, I want to keep all my colors straight here. The red one, which is basically that same red one like that, and the purple one, now delta V is that way. You notice delta V is not in the same direction. It's a little steeper here than it was there. So this tells me the acceleration isn't constant. And remember, we can only use A is equal to delta V over delta T. In two cases, if the acceleration is constant, you can use it always. But the acceleration is not constant. It's in a different direction. Or for very small delta T. So we have to think about what happens like this when the acceleration gets very small. Well, OK, you can, you can kind of imagine what happens is if I rotate this VF to be closer and closer to here, which is what happens if I consider the car after a smaller and smaller delta t, as I rotate it closer and closer here, this delta v is going to get more and more horizontal. So the answer to this, b, is going to be that the acceleration is in the minus x direction. So that does come out perpendicular to the velocity, so there's no component along the velocity. So the acceleration will end up being this way. Now, I'm actually going to answer a question I didn't ask. The velocity is that way. And that is, 
what's the magnitude of the acceleration? Now, to answer this, I'm going to have to define a new variable here. That's the radius of the track that the car is moving around on. So let's think about how do you figure out what the magnitude of the acceleration is. Well, so what I'm going to do is take the car at like the black and the red times, but I'm going to move it much closer. So here is V. And then a little bit later, the car is now here. So a time delta T later, the car is there. So we'll call this VI. We'll call it, and I'll, with a vector now, because, I mean, it's the vector V. Here's VF. And then the delta V is, ooh, pretend that's a straight line. Delta V is just that. So how would I figure out this delta V? Well, okay. If I know this angle here, I might be able to figure it out, right? That angle, which I'll call, I should call it with a delta because it's little. We'll call this angle here delta theta. And here's another thing that I know. If I draw this part of the track bigger, the car started here. And then a little bit later, so he's now going that direction. He's now here. All right. And if I draw from the center of the track to here, and the center of the track to here, this, well, given that the velocity is always perpendicular to the radius, so this is perpendicular to that black line, and this red line is perpendicular to that red line, this is going to be the same delta theta, right? And we know from the whole rotational motion thing that the distance the car has traveled is going to equal r delta theta as long as I do delta theta in radians, right? r is the radius of the track. So that distance is r delta theta. Okay, that's very good. And so now I know that um, the speed of the car is r delta theta over delta t, which is also r omega. We actually already knew that. But it's r delta theta over delta t. That's good. So now let's think about what is this delta V here? Well, to do that, what I'm going to do, because this actually is not a right triangle here. Um, so I'm going to divide this in half like this. So it really is a right triangle. And now I know that delta V, the magnitude of it, divided by 2, divided by the speed of the car, because both of these legs have a length of the speed of the car. Well, that is going to be the um, opposite to delta theta over 2 divided by the hypotenuse. So that's sine of delta theta over 2. Now here's a thing I'm about to do. It turns out um, that for small angles, now this is a thing I wouldn't expect you to know. So for small angles alpha in radians, sine of alpha is very close to alpha. Try it on your calculator. You'll discover up to even alpha of like 0.1 radians. This works pretty well. But if you put in really small numbers in radians and you take the sine of it, you get the same number back. It doesn't work for big ones, but for small alpha that is. And we're definitely talking small angles here. So I have delta V over 2 divided by V. So that's delta T, right? That was the opposite over adjacent. Delta V over 2V is approximately equal to delta theta over 2, right? Or delta theta is approximately equal to, the 2's cancel, delta V over V. So I'm going to take this and this, and I'm going to put them together. So if delta theta is approximately equal to delta V over V, what I will do is solve this whole thing for delta theta here. So this one gives me delta theta is equal to V over R times delta T. Now I can put in this delta theta. So delta V divided by V, right, that's delta theta from over here, is also equal to V over R times delta T. What I'm after is the acceleration, which is delta V delta T, at least in magnitude. So if I divide both sides by delta T, multiply both sides by V, I get delta V over delta T, that's the magnitude of the acceleration, is V squared over R. 
So it turns out, and this is something we'll see later when we talk about circular motion, that by thinking about these angles carefully and thinking about what we know now about rotational motion, you can actually work out, of course you had to know this little thing too, but if you know this little thing, which is true, you can work out that the acceleration of the car um, is V squared over R and it points towards the center, so this is a car moving in a circle, points towards the center of the circle that it's moving in. So that's B. All right, on to part C. So now we know that the acceleration is in that direction, and in fact we know its magnitude is V squared over R. Let's go on to part C. And that is, what are the forces acting on the car? Well, if you want to think about forces, um, then draw a free body diagram. So let's draw a free body diagram for the car. I'm going to draw the free body diagram like this. Now, here's something you need to do when you draw a free body diagram of the car looking at the side of the car. Notice we're looking at the top of the car here. So we're looking down the z-axis, which meant it's like we are looking down here. So I know that that direction has to be z. So now I need to think about which side of the car I'm looking at. Well, let's suppose that I am looking from here at the side of the car. So if I'm looking that way, that means I am looking that way. That means that x has to be into the board here. And finally, I know that x cross y has to equal z. So to make that work, I have x into the board cross y equals z. That tells me that y has to be this way. Or um, you could think here the way if I'm over here looking at the car and, and up is up, y will look like it's to the left to me, and sure enough, that works. Okay, so the car is moving in the minus y direction. So to the right is the direction of its motion, but this is a free body diagram, so I don't want to draw that arrow on here. Let's draw all the forces acting on it. There is the force of gravity. There is normal forces, and now there's this question. Do we want to divide it up, one for each tire, in which case there's four of them, or do we want to just combine them all together into one? I'm going to combine them all together in one in this case, and I'm going to draw it acting here, because that really is where it acts, because it's the average of acting here and acting here. So that average is going to be here, assuming that it's not leading more one way or the other way, which sometimes they do. Like when they're accelerating, they'll have to do that. Um, and it is accelerating, so maybe it is a little offset. But so the normal force, in fact, you probably know this from going around corners in cars, that if it's a flat road and you go over too tight, too tight of a corner, you're going to flip your car over, which suggests it is leaning one way. Um, but that's going to be along this direction. So the normal force will act here. I drew a terrible arrow. So that's another force on the car. We know the car is going that way, so there's going to be an air resistance force, a drag force acting that way. And then finally, there is rubber on the road, which means there's friction forces. Which way do they go? Well, if the car is moving at constant speed in the y direction, which instantaneously, here it is, a little bit later it's going to be moving not, no longer entirely in the y direction, but we know that the acceleration is in the x direction. So if there's no acceleration in the y direction, there has to be a force balancing the drag force, so that means that static friction is going to point this way. But we're not done, because we know the acceleration here is in the negative x direction. There's an acceleration out of the board. And so the question is, what is the force that gives that acceleration out of the board? Well, there's only one thing looking at this car really can be. I mean, you, you could imagine mounting rocket engines on the side of the car and <laughs> shooting them to get an acceleration that way. That's not what we're doing. It turns out that the static friction force actually also has a component out of the board. So the static friction force is really the sum of the component forward and the component like that, and it gets really hard to draw in 3D um, on the board. So I'll just I'll do one of my little 3D things again, and here's the car, and, and then I put the little arrows on for the normal force and gravity and the drag force. And now, um, if you look at the car, you kind of rotate around in 3D. In fact, if you look at the bottom of the car, you can see here that the friction force is not entirely in just the Y direction, but it's also a little bit in the X direction. Right? Another way I could have done that was if I also draw a free body diagram from above. So now it's X, Y, Z like this. And so the static friction has to have a component. Now it's going to act on all the wheels, but I'll just draw it on the front wheels here. So the car's going that way in the minus y direction. It has to have a component in the minus y direction, but also a component in the um, minus x direction. 
Yes. Sorry, my brain just froze up. So static friction as viewed from above would some, be something like this. Then I could have the drag force, and I could have gravity, which acts into the page, and I could have the normal force acting out of the page. All right, and that's what the free body diagram would look like from above. So static friction will end up having a net force into the page. And that actually answers the next question. What is the force responsible for keeping the car from slowing down due to air resistance? Static friction between the wheels and the road. Which seems weird. It's like, I thought the force came from the engine. Well, that's where the energy comes from. And we'll talk about that when we talk about energy. What the engine is really doing is providing a torque to offset the frictional torque to keep the wheels rolling at a constant rate. So that's where the energy puts torque on the wheels. But ultimately, the thing pushing on the car is the ground. It's when you walk. It's the ground pushing on you that propels you forward. And so the last two questions, what is the force responsible for keeping the car from slowing down due to air resistance? Static friction. Tires on the road. What is the force keeping the car turning in the circle instead of driving straight? So without a force in the minus x direction, it would just keep going that way. It's the force of static friction turning around that makes it go around in circles. So static, I just uh, the thing just stopped because I, I reached the maximum file size. All I was saying is static friction, rubber on the road. That's the end of problem one. Problem two, you are playing tug of war. The goal is to pull a rope hard enough that the other team isn't able to come up with the force necessary to offset the tension in the rope. I know you've always thought about that when you play tug of war. So here's the two person model of tug of war. You have a person, you have a rope. Oh my God, I need to draw my rope. I'm just gonna draw a line and pretend it's a rope. And you have another person who's pulling on the rope, and both people pull on the rope, so the rope has tension in it. So if I draw a free body force diagram for the person, uh, there's normal force, there's gravity, and there's tension of the rope. So you can already see that there's got to be something else. Well, there's got to be static friction between your foot and the ground, otherwise you would get pulled over. Um, and it's, it'll be very similar in this guy, except tension will be that way. So we'll just think about this one person here. And then the question is, why do you lean back like this? So there's tension, right? And so you know when you really play tug of war, if things get tough, you kind of lean back like that when you're pulling on the rope. And the question is, why? Why do you do that? Well, all right. Let's just start the way we always start these things, by thinking about what has to be true. And if you're playing tug of war and you're in the middle and you're holding on, you're briefly not moving. And if you start moving, that means you've lost. Or if you go whoop and fall over backwards and you get dragged over, and by the way, to make tug of war interesting, there has to be a lake in the middle here. And in the lake, there have to be sharks. But it's a pink shark because of, of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So, um, so you get dragged into the lake and the shark tears you to pieces, and that's bad. So you don't want to lose, so you stand like this. Um, why? Why do you stand like that? So we'll do what we usually do with the forces. If you're still, we know that the sum of the forces in the x direction has to equal zero, right? The real condition is that the net sum of the forces is zero if you're staying at rest. Well, I'm just going to do the components. So in the x direction at zero, that's equal to, let's, I forgot to define my axes, so x, y with z out of the board. So that's equal to ft minus fsf. That's very exciting. The sum of forces in the y direction also have to equal zero, which in this case, I'm assuming a purely horizontal rope. In this case, that's the normal force minus your mass times gravity, which is what fg is. That's great. Nothing about that says anything about leaning. But let's think about the torques that are, that are being exerted. And so there's this question, what, where do you want to measure the torques from? Let's measure the torques from your center of mass. There's lots of places we could do it. For now, let's just measure it from your center of mass. Well, okay, if it's from your center of mass, gravity has no lever arm, so therefore there's no net torque. The normal force, I've drawn it a little offset here, but really it's between your two feet. And if you're standing straight up, the normal force is acting on average halfway between your two feet. So the normal force is acting like that. It's anti-parallel to the lever arm from here to where the normal force acts. So there's no torque from the normal force. The torque from tension, and here, don't, don't even think about right-hand rules and stuff. Just think about, if I pull that way on that and that way on that, this guy's going to start spinning, right? Just 
pulled like that, he's going to start spinning. So torque ultimately is the reason why you have to worry about it. Now if you do want to worry about right hand rules, let's start at your center of mass and you go up to the tension force, so R, that displacement, cross F, that's a torque into the board. For static friction, you go from here to where the force acts, that's R down that way, force that's also into the board. Both torques are into the board. So let's think about what happens when you lean. So when you lean like this, and I'm going to turn this into a free body diagram, you're going to have the tension force acting there, you're going to have gravity acting there, you're going to have the normal force somewhere halfway between your feet, it's probably stronger on, the, on that foot than this foot, but it's going to be somewhere halfway in between your feet, we'll call it there, and then finally static friction this way. All right, these two equations still apply, right? This free body diagram, I forgot to draw the arrow on FT. This, this free body diagram still gives you those two equations, but now we have enough offsets that we can start to think about what the torques are on all of this. So the next, now the question is, where do we want to measure torques about? Let's change our position a little bit. Let's measure torques about the um, place where the normal force acts, which we'll say is sort of halfway down, halfway between your two feet. And so this here, that's the um, lever arm for gravity. This is the lever arm for tension. And this is the lever arm for static friction. Um, in fact, actually, static friction can't have a lever arm because it's going to act on average at the same place as the normal force. So static friction has no torque. Normal force has no for torque measuring them around your feet. So now what we can conclude is that the gravity's torque, Rg cross Mg, is out, right? Because gravity's trying to make you fall over this way. But tension, Rt cross Ft, is into the board, is offsetting. So if you just stood like this, the tension on the rope would pull you over. The more you lean back, the more torque you get from gravity, right? If I lean really steep, my gravitational force is going to stay the same. But if I lean really steep, the lever arm gets more and more perpendicular, gets more and more perpendicular to gravity, and so the torque, remember torque equals R cross F, and the magnitude of the torque is equal to RF times sine of the angle between them, right, so, which you can use that angle for this, it turns out, that wouldn't work for cross products. But as the sine of the angle gets closer to 90 degrees, I mean, really, I should say, really the angle between them is this, because you have to put them tail to tail to talk about the angle between them, but the sine of that and the sine of this are the same. But in any event, as sine gets closer to 90 degrees, the uh, magnitude of the torque gets bigger. Or another way of thinking about it is, remember in one of the homeworks, I had said argue why it's the perpendicular component. The component perpendicular to gravity is a bigger and bigger fraction. This length is going to be the same. Your center of mass is where it is. So the gravitational torque gets bigger, which means you can have a stronger and stronger FT without gravity or without the tension pulling you over that way. So you want to lean back as much as you can. So why not lean all the way down? Well, here's another thing. As FT gets stronger and stronger, that means um, FT gets stronger. FSF also gets stronger and stronger. So I'm going to have SFSF which will be equal to Ft, but it also has to be less than or equal to the normal force, which means Fsf has to, sorry, not the normal force, it has to be less than or equal to the static of coefficient, coefficient of static friction times the normal force, which has to be less than or equal to the static of coefficient, that thing, coefficient of static friction times mg, Fsf. So eventually Fsf will get big enough. You lean back far enough, to balance this torque, Ft will get big. It'll, it'll get too big. Um, this FSF that you need, right, to balance this, will get too big for your coefficient of friction times mg. And when that happens, your feet will slide out from under you, you'll get dragged in, and you will be eaten by the shark. And that's overall good, right, because sharks are part of nature and we want to support them. So go feed the sharks, go swimming in shark infested waters today. That's the real lesson from this. Um, the third problem, you can obtain some mechanical advantage by using a system of multiple pulleys in order to lift things. One of the simplest of such arrangements is arrangements, not arrangements, that's for lawyers, is shown to the right. So I will reproduce the picture here. 
So you have the ceiling. Hanging from the ceiling, there is a ideal pulley. So the ideal pulley comes down here, and then you pull on this side of the ideal pulley. And the other side of the pulley goes down to another pulley, which is attached to the thing you want to lift. I drew it wrong. Another pulley like that. And so the string loops under the other pulley, comes up, and you attach it to the ceiling again. This isn't the most traditional way to do it. Really what you do is have these two pulleys on top of each other and loop around several times. But we're going to think about this one. So this is one cord that goes over this pulley, that pulley, and to the ceiling again. There's you, here's the box. Why is there any mechanical advantage in doing this? Well, I don't really know. So let's try and figure it out. So, uh, first of all, it's an ideal string. So the tension, FT, the magnitude of the tension is the same everywhere within the string. Next, these are ideal pulleys which is necessary for the tension to be same everywhere in the string, and we basically don't have to worry about them. Pulleys are just a way of changing the direction of the string. They're frictionless, and they're massless. So what's left? Well, let's do free body diagrams. So here is the box that you're lifting. We don't know what it is, so I'm going to give its mass. I'm going to call it MB. I'm going to draw it here. I'll draw it over here. MB is its mass. So there's going to be an MBG gravity force downwards. And then, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to include this pulley as part of this box. Say so that that whole thing is one object. So then there are two FTs up. Right? You have FT up and FT up there because the rope is going up in both directions. It's got to be like that. All right. I'm going to do a free body diagram for this pulley. I have F, I don't know what to call this, I'm going to call it F support, because it's the support from the ceiling. And we have FT down, and another FT down. All right, so we have, the, we have the forces on the pulley, and then this is basically exerted by you. To, to do that, we'll think about your free body diagram. So you have gravity downwards of your mass, I'll do MP for massive person. We have your normal force of the ground upwards, and we also have the tension force upwards. And then by Newton's third law, and so what we're going to imagine is, is that we're lifting this box at a constant rate. So it's basically you don't want it to stop, so you don't want it to slow down and stop, nor do you want it to start falling again. If you're lifting it at a constant rate, that means its acceleration is zero. So if its acceleration is zero, that means that the acceleration of this bit of rope is zero. And if I think about the free body diagram at the bottom of that bit of rope, there is, this is right at the bottom of the rope, there's FT downwards and FT upwards, because that's how rope works. Same tension everywhere, which means that this force downwards, which is the Newton's third law partner to this force, here's the bit of rope, here's you, third law partners, equal and opposite, that's the force you are exerting. So this here, it's how much the rope pulls on you, same as how much you pull on the rope. This is how hard it is to pull. So let's go back to this. And notice if you want this guy to be coming up at a constant rate, then the sum of forces, let's go ahead and define our axes, x and y that way. The sum of forces in the y direction is equal to 2ft minus mbg. Or that tells you that ft is equal to mbg over 2. That right there is the nature of the advantage. How hard you have to pull is only half of the weight of the box. Right? Whereas, if it was just a pulley like this, with you pulling this side and the box hanging here, you would have to pull with a tension that was exactly the same as the weight of the box. The fact that you have this pulley here and you have these two ropes up means you only have to pull with half the weight of the box. So that is where the mechanical advantage comes from. Now, you might think, wow, that's amazing. How, you know, free lunch. Well, there is one thing you lose. And the thing you lose is, if you think about it, if I pull this rope down, say, one meter, right? so the rope pulls down one meter, what that means is that one meter has gone from here to here, so one meter has gone from here to here. So this whole length of rope has to get shorter by one meter. Well, the way it's going to do that is by um, moving this guy up half a meter. Because if you move this guy up half a meter, the rope 
has gotten shorter by that half meter and that half meter, so the rope is shorter by one meter. So when you do this, um, you will have to pull twice as far as that guy goes. So it's easier to do because you don't have to exert as much force, but you're going to have to do it for longer. So it's not really a free lunch. You do actually offset yourself. And when we talk about energy, we'll talk about the work necessary, and we'll see it all works out. Now, you can do even better than this. If instead of this setup, you have a pulley like this and a pulley on the thing, and you loop it around several times, right, and then eventually tie it off on this guy, and then you pull here. And how for each time you loop it around, you get another mechanical advantage of a, you know, two more tensions. Eventually it'll break down because the, the approximation that the pulley is frictionless won't be any good anymore, and you get no advantage for adding stuff because now you're just pulling against the friction of the pulley. But for the first few, you can actually get a big advantage, and you can just pull not very hard for a long time on a rope and slowly lift a really heavy object. So that's where you get the mechanical advantage from. Now, um, my next question was, if you're worrying about making sure things don't break, what is the most likely point of failure? Well, anywhere it could fail. So let me ask it this way. Where are the forces strongest? Well, so if you think about it, this F support in magnitude is itself going to have to be 2FT, right? Because this pulley is not moving. So to keep it from moving, F support minus 2FT has to be zero. So that means that pulling down on the ceiling right here is 2FT, and right next to it on the ceiling pulling down is another FT. So you're pulling down with 3FT on the ceiling. If you imagine this, the, the strength at which you're pulling down on the ceiling can get pretty high in this case. So where you're most likely to fail actually is at here at the ceiling. And again, it depends on what's strongest and what's not. If you're using a ceiling like I have in this room where it's these little thin metal bars with the very lightweight panels in them, you're almost certainly going to pull this out before you do much more. So if you're putting pulleys and cranes and stuff, you have to have big strong supports at top to be able to hold them. The other place is that right here, this bit, has that little guy has to have a tension of 2FT in it to offset these two. So that's another place it could break. So if you really care about where it's breaking, you have to think about the strength of each one of these things and how much tension can they support before they break. But don't forget that your ceiling may not be able to support infinite weight before it collapses in on you. And then at that point, you might as well just go feed yourself to the shark from the first problem. So that's the third problem. When you jump off a building, that's a bit much, but here we're going to, do, we're going to demonstrate this. I'm not going to jump off a building. I'm going to jump off a hassock. So here I am. It's not as strong as I hope. And I jump off. Whoa! And I was falling. Okay, you get the idea. While I'm falling, not only do you fall towards the earth, but the earth also falls up towards you. Whoa. What is the acceleration of the earth as a result of your falling towards it? How does it compare to the acceleration of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun? Well, that's very interesting. So here's the basic idea. This is you. Here is a highly undersized Earth. So here's the center of the Earth. This is you. Here's your center of mass. The distance between you and the center of the Earth is that very close to the radius of the Earth. So the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. That's how far you are from the Earth. Let's draw a free body force diagram for each one of these. Here is your free body force diagram. Done. We're going to ignore your resistance. Not insignificant when you jump off a building, but when you're first falling, that's it. There's that force down on you, where this is your mass. So then on the Earth, here's the Earth's free body diagram ignoring absolutely everything else in the universe except for you, because, you know, that's kind of how we think of ourselves anyway. There's going to be a force up of strength mg on you, and we know that because of Newton's third law. If the Earth is exerting a force mg on me, that's what this gravity is. By Newton's third law, I am exerting a force of mg on the Earth. So then the question is, what is the acceleration of the Earth as a result of this? I know the acceleration of me, I can say F is equal to MA, well F is MG, which is equal to MA, so my acceleration, the magnitude of my acceleration is G, and it's towards the center of the Earth, which is what we mean when we say down. 
what is the acceleration of the Earth? Well, first of all, it's going to be up, because that's the direction of the force. So the acceleration of the Earth, the force on the Earth, is going to equal the mass of the Earth times the acceleration of the Earth. This little plus with a circle around it is the symbol for Earth. Or A of Earth is equal to force over the mass of the Earth, which is m g over mass of the Earth. So the acceleration of the Earth as a result of being pulled towards you as you're falling towards it is equal to your mass, let's say you are 75 kilograms, times little g, 9.8 meters per second squared, divided by the mass of the Earth, which is 6.0 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. This is going to be very small. Stick it in my calculator. And I get 1.2 times 10 to the minus 22 meters per second squared, otherwise known as not very much. Compare this, I tell you, how does it compare to the acceleration of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun? Well, we can do that. Oh, I don't need the mass of the Earth anymore. We can do that. This was a homework problem, actually, but here we go. We're going to do it again. Here's the Earth. Here's the Sun, the standard sunny side up model of the Sun. I'll draw a free body diagram in place for the Earth. There's the force of the Sun on Earth with gravity, F seg. That's the only force on Earth. Uh, yeah, there's Jupiter and all the other planets, but if we ignore all the other planets, the only force on Earth and the Moon, the only force is the Sun's gravity on the Earth. Now, we can't use mg for this because Earth is not close to the center of the, the center, the surface of the Sun. So we know that it, this force is going to be equal to big G times the mass of the Sun times the mass of the Earth divided by, and now we have to use this distance, r squared. Okay, that's going to equal the mass of the Earth times its acceleration due to its orbit, I'll call that a sub o, is going to equal this in magnitude over r squared. Notice the mass of the Earth cancels out. That's why in that problem I told you all you don't need the mass of the Earth. So now I can plug in the numbers. Well, big G is 6.674, if I remember correctly, times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram second squared. Mass of the sun is 2.0 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, if I remember correctly, but I'm pretty sure I'd do that one. And finally, R is 1.495 times 10 to the 11th meters squared. So I'll stick this in my calculator now. I actually looked it up. This should have been 1.496. But that doesn't matter because I'm only going to report my answer to two sig figs. Um, if I look this up in my calculator, it's 0 0.0060. 0 0.0060. Um, meters per second squared, or 1, 2, 3, 6.0 times 10 to the minus third meters per second squared. So that sounds small, right? The acceleration of the Earth as it goes around the Sun is very small. Actually, it had better be, because we experience that acceleration as well. And if that acceleration was comparable to gravity, then we would notice if we were on the far side of the Earth, so midnight or the close side of the Earth to the Sun, noon, we would have measurably different weights. But as it is, it's four orders of magnitude down, so we don't actually notice it. So how does this compare to this? One is way bigger than the other. In fact, what I would do is I would just say um, the acceleration of the Earth as a result of being attracted to you when you jump, divided by the acceleration as a result of its orbit around the Sun, is 6.0 times, sorry, wrong way around, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 22 meters per second squared divided by 6.0 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second. Um, 6 divided by 1.2 is 5, so I know this is going to be 1 fifth times 10 to the minus 22 mi divided by 10 to the minus 3 minus 22 minus minus 3. It's going to be 1 fifth times 10 to the minus 19, which is the same as 2 times 10 to the minus 20 is the ratio. What that says is it's a factor of 10 to the 20 smaller. I would have to know this acceleration to 20 significant figures before you jumping around on the Earth would make any difference to the acceleration of the Earth. Right? It's down here. 
20 significant figures lower. I mean, it looks like 19, but it's 6 versus 12. So whatever, 19 or 20 significant figures lower. So the Earth does really feel a force upward and accelerate upwards towards you when you're jumping down, when you're falling really is what matters. When you're falling, Earth has a force on you, so you have a force on the Earth. It's really there. It's real. It's happening. It is so tiny that any sensible analysis of the motion of the Earth will ignore it. It's just not important. Real, but not important. That's the end of these problems. Thank you.